So I don't go along with the idea that there's just one kind of consciousness. I disagree. There's something about this sort of um, theory of consciousness that we're searching for and who, whose consciousness are we trying to explain, right? I think that's what I'm trying to say. Who's, who's, who's consciousness? And is there any evidence for the fact that our consciousness is somehow still related to the consciousnesses yes, of yes. squids and other things? Well, I would say yes. We are animals like other animals. Of course, as I said at the beginning, we have different definitions, but also levels of consciousness, right? We have to get used to the uh, fact that complex phenomena like consciousness cannot be answered or addressed with one single theory. There are different aspects of our consciousness, of course. Some of them relate to other organisms. For example, uh, we have an immune system that allow us to continuously distinguish what is self and what is non-self. And this is a first ground to what higher level of consciousness are. There are genetic aspects for consciousness. I would be different at, at different concepts so consciousness, if I would be a fish, for example. And uh, as human beings, we have language related levels of consciousness. We can talk about ourselves and create a narrative of what we are. But all these levels of consciousness are nested to, to each other and are grounded to something more, more fundamental that is experience. And so experience is what unify all of us organism. I think this is the aspect that we have more in common, if I'm not wrong. As it, it's it's important to say that a theory, a theory by definition has to have predictable, has to, it has to make predictions to be a theory, which means that you have to be able to have things to test, right? So, I mean, perhaps actually, the way we understand consciousness, or at least what you're describing, Stuart, for example, I mean, that should have very, that should be a unifiable theory of consciousness and should have very predictable outcomes, right? I mean, what would, what would convince you, for example, Dennis, of, of a theory of consciousness that ties us all the way down to, to, well, well anything? I, I partly answered that, and I think the question you just put to us, whose consciousness are we talking about, is a very good question in this debate, because what I said in the first part of my statement is that degrees of consciousness exist. And I don't think we should think that what it is like to be a bacterium, what it is like to be one of the early Cambrian animals, what it is like to be a bat, to quote Ernest Nagel, and what it is like to be us are in some sense very similar. They probably are not. There can be qualitative differences that depend on the degrees to which that kind of feeling is exhibited. So I don't go along with the idea that there's just one kind of consciousness. I think you were right to ask us that question. I disagree. Uh, all animals, plants, including fish, uh, have microtubules. All animals, plants, including fish, can be anesthetized. And they work, uh, the anesthesia has the same, almost the same effects on all of them. And we know that the anesthetics work on a common mechanism uh, due to something called the Meyer-Overton correlation that shows potency in putting humans, animals, insects, fish under anesthesia is the same for every animal. It's at, at equilibrium. So it takes the same amount of anesthetic gas to put an elephant to sleep as an insect at equilibrium if you wait long enough to equilibrate. And uh, they all have microtubules. So I think they're, they're all working the same. Of course, they're different. It's different to be a bat than to be us or to be an insect. But I think they have experience. They have awareness. They have feelings. And I think it's those feelings that drive their behavior to survive and evolve. So just go ahead, Antonella. No. OK. So I think it's important what you said before, that we need to have theories of consciousness that make prediction and not simply, and they are not simply coherent from a conceptual point of view. So I think a way to go is to break down the concept of consciousness and to see whether we can test experiences. For example, subjective experiences, I mean. For example, we as human beings and some other animals too, uh, perceive events as longer or shorter according to different 
ecological, physiological conditions. We can test this and we can test whether also other animals like us perceive events as shorter when they perceive a threat and they have to escape and they have to react faster or as longer when they perceive things that are problematic and they need to reflect on them in order to escape from a situation. <laughs> We've all had the experience of being sat in a exactly. classroom that just never seems <laughs> to end. So there are possibilities of breaking down experiences and to test them and to see whether organisms that have them are, have more adaptive value, have more fitness than others. And so we can go from there. Interesting. I mean, just to go back to your point, Stuart, just, to, just so I'm very clear, I'm obviously no anesthesiologist, theologist, but basically what I understood of what you're saying is if an organism has neurons, it can be anesthetized. It doesn't even have to have neurons. You can anesthetize a paramecium. You can? Yes. And an amoeba. Uh, you know, an amoeba can solve the traveling salesman problem because its microtubules go this way or that way, depending on where there's food. And yes, you can anesthetize. And it takes the same amount to anesthetize an amoeba as it does you or, you or me at equilibrium. But I mean, so anyone who's had a general anesthetic in this room knows that experience that you're talking about where you lose the consciousness. In fact, all of us go to sleep at night, right? Then once some could argue that we've all had the experience of the loss of consciousness in that context. We do that every night, right? So, but how do we know that when that happens to an organism, on the evolutionary tree that they're having the same sort of experience that we have. Maybe they just sort of stop moving and that's all that happens to them. Well, uh, we, go, we lose, first of all, sleep is different because uh, you, can, you can dream and that's a form of consciousness huh. by, by the, uh, the signs. And uh, the fact that, you, that all the anesthetics follow the Meyer-Overton correlation, so they are, they are all acting at the same target which looks like microtubules. And I think Dennis asked for, we need some, or maybe somebody asked for, for tests. And, and the test for uh, consciousness is uh, what cause, uh, how does anesthesia work? And it's been thought uh, for the last 50 years that they act on membrane proteins, but uh, that doesn't work. And the evidence now shows is pointing to acting on microtubules and specifically inhibiting quantum effects in microtubules. So you don't have to cause depolymerization. You just have to uh, dampen the uh, very delicate quantum effects. And we've shown that experimentally. But doesn't, I mean, if, unless one of you two wants to jump in, doesn't that mean that, does that mean that you think that a computer could never reach consciousness? Correct. Fantastic, you heard it here first. Maybe a, a special quantum computer that can collapse by the Penrose mechanism made of something like fullerenes, but silicon, no. Well, Interesting. I partially agree on that because a modern computer cannot be conscious, like I think that, but I think at some point we will have cyborg. So there are already embodied AI that means that like they are built bottom up. There are synthetic cells that are synthetic, artificial, but are, they are made with mechanisms and materials that are more similar to organic matter. And they are good candidates to be conscious at some point. So... Well, it's, it, if I may, it's my, it, uh, that my friend uh, Honor Bonbonjapadye, uh, working in Japan, uh, is building an organic quantum computer something like that could be conscious because it's made of the same organic molecules that can undergo these quantum states and collapses. So something like that is possible. But uh, silicon, uh, the way it's, they're configured now, I would say no. Yeah, okay. But also this microtubule theory is not a little bit like a Descartes, a Cartesian view of consciousness according to which consciousness is like in a box, in a specific part of our brain and is not and more like an emergent phenomenon of a complex system. I don't know if it is true. I would like to take up the question of silicon not being the medium. And I think that is a right line to go along because the difficulty with silicon is that the molecules are completely fixed. It's like a crystal. It's a solid structure. And so there can be vibration but they can't be what we have. We are made of this, water. And when you look at particles in water, they are doing this all the time. It's Brownian motion for those who know the phenomenon. Our cells are doing that absolutely all the time. 
I think to get to the what I really mean by unlimited associative learning, I think you need those many degrees of freedom. Because what you'll be trying to do is to find combinations that, rather like the immune system, can be selected from to be appropriate and align with what it is that we are consciously trying to do. Without that alignment, I can't see how we can have a proper theory of consciousness. It's really, I mean, it's really interesting because what I mean, we're picking up on the fact. Sorry, and then I'll let you let you go, Stuart. But I mean, we've all kind of just agreed on the fact that consciousness is a property of biological organisms effectively that it's necessary and biological organisms are also subject to the rules of evolution right those things go hand in hand so actually to loop back around to what we were we were sort of started off by saying about this is there some sort of contradiction between evolutionary theories and consciousness theories i mean it seems to me that basically they're predicated upon each other one one above the other right you can't get one without the other f f at all right am i, am I sort of correct in in well, l let me address uh, something Antonella said and then Dennis. And Antonella said, uh, the Cartesian theater implies that consciousness is in one place in the brain. And that's what most theories of consciousness say, uh, uh, prefrontal cortex or the posterior hot zone or whatever. And I think it's distributed, more like a hologram. And the, the microtubules must be entangled. That's the key. And Anurban, my colleague in Japan, has recently shown entanglement between biological microtubules at ambient temperature. And of course, you need, you need quantum at ambient temperature, which addresses Dennis's question uh, that uh, we're mostly made of water. It's true, 70%. But the brain's not uh, monolithic. It's actually he highly heterogeneous, as, as you know. And within uh, nonpolar regions, uh, uh, fat-like, uh, lipid-like regions in, uh, deep inside proteins where you have all these aromatic rings uh, where the anesthetic, where anesthetics go, where anesthetics bind and specifically uh, block consciousness, uh, uh, there's no water. It's, it's, it's nonpolar hydrophobic, so it, it, the water is kicked out and, and it's oscillating, so it's, it's warm but not noisy. So within these uh, nonpolar aromatic, what we call the quantum underground, uh, within, within biology are regions, kind of thread-like regions inside all the proteins, particularly microtubules, which are very, very long. You can have uh, sustained quantum effects that are sustained at least until they collapse and give you a moment of consciousness. But that depends entirely on the basis of your position that the quantum effects are essential. I'm not sure of that, you see. I think that is something we've not yet demonstrated. Yeah, I okay. think it's important to have new hypotheses on the table. Of course. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.